The Roll Call of the Reef by Arthur Quiller Couch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Craster. The Roll Call of the Reef by Arthur Quiller Couch. Yes, sir, said my host, the quarryman, reaching down the relics from their hook in the wall over the chimney piece. They've hung here all my time, and most of my father's. The women won't touch em. They're afraid of the story. So here they'll dangle and gather dust and smoke till another tenant comes and tosses em out of doors for rubbish. Phew! Tis coarse weather, surely. He went to the door, opened it, and stood studying the gale that beat upon his cottage front, straight from the manacle reef. The rain drove past him into the kitchen, a slant like threads of gold silk in the shine of the wreckwood fire. Meanwhile, by the same firelight, I examined the relics on my knee. The metal of each was tarnished out of knowledge, but the trumpet was evidently an old cavalry trumpet, and the threads of its party-coloured sling, though fretted and dusty, still hung together. Around the side drum, beneath its cracked brown varnish, I could hardly trace a royal coat of arms and a legend running. Per mar per terrain, the motto of the marines. Its parchment, though black and scented with wood smoke, was limp and mildewed, and I began to tighten up the straps, under which the drumsticks had been loosely thrust, with the idle purpose of trying if some music might be got out of the old drum yet. But as I turned it on my knee, I found the drum attached to the trumpet sling by a curious barrel-shaped padlock, and paused to examine this. The body of the lock was composed of half a dozen brass rings set accurately edge to edge, and rubbing the brass with my thumb, I saw that each of the six had a series of letters engraved around it. I knew the tricks of it, I thought. Here was one of those word padlocks once so common, only to be opened by getting the rings to spell a certain word which the dealer confides to you. My host shut and barred the door, and came back to the hearth. "'Twas just such a wind, east by south, that brought in what you've got between your hands. Back in the year nine, it was, my father has told me the tale a score of times. You're twisting round the rings, I see.' but you'll never guess the word. Parson Kendall, he made the word, and he locked down a couple of ghosts in their graves with it, and when his time came, he went to his own grave and took the word with him. Whose ghosts, Matthew? You want the story, I see, sir. My father could tell it better than I can. He was a young man in the year nine, unmarried at the time, and living in this very cottage, just as I be. That's how he came to get mixed up with the tale. He took a chair, lighted a short pipe, and went on, with his eyes fixed on the dancing violet flames. Yes, he had been about thirty year old in January, eighteen nine. The storm got up in the night of the twenty-first of that month. My father was dressed and out long before daylight. He never was one to bide in bed, let be that the gale by this time was pretty near lifting the thatch over his head. Besides which, he'd fenced a small taily patch that winter, down by Lowland Point, and he wanted to see if it stood the night's work. He took the path across Gunner's Meadow, where they buried most of the bodies afterward. The wind was right in his teeth at the time, and once on the way, he stole me this often a great strip of oarweed came flying through the darkness and fetched him a slap on the cheek like a cold hand. But he made shift pretty well till he got to Lowland, and then had to drop down upon hands and knees and crawl, digging his fingers every now and then into the shingle to hold on. For he declared to me that the stones, some of them as big as a man's head, kept rolling and driving past till it seemed the whole foreshore was moving westward under him. The fence was gone, of course, not a stick left to show where it stood, 
so that when first he came to the place he thought he must have missed his bearings my father sir was a very religious man and if he reckoned the end of the world was at hand there in the great wind and night among the moving stones you may believe he was certain of it when he heard a gun fired and with the same saw a flame shoot up out of the darkness to windward making a sudden fierce light in all the place about all he could find to think or say was the second coming the second coming the bridegroom cometh and the wicked he will toss like a ball into a large country and being already upon his knees he just bowed his head and bided saying this over and over but by and by between two squalls he made bold to lift his head and look and then by the light a bluish colour it was he saw all the coast clear way to manacle point and of the manacles in the thick of the weather a sloop of war with top gallant's house driving stern foremost toward the reef it was she of course that was burning the flare my father could see the white streak and the ports of her quiet plain as she rose to it a little outside the breakers and he guessed easy enough that her captain had just managed to wear ship and was trying to force her nose to the sea with the help of her small bower anchor and the scrap or two of canvas that hadn't yet been blown out of her but while he looked she fell off giving her broadside to it foot by foot and drifting back on the breakers around camp dew and the varses the rocks lie so thick thereabout that twas a toss-up which she struck first at any rate my father couldn't tell at the time for just then the flare died down and went out well sir he turned then in the dark and started for coverock to cry about the dismal tidings though well knowing ship and crew to be past any hope and as he turned the wind lifted him and tossed him forward like a ball as he'd been saying and homeward along the foreshore as you know tis ugly work even by daylight picking your way among the stones there and my father was prettily knocked about at first in the dark but by this it was nearer seven than six o'clock and the day spreading by the time he reached north corner a man could see to read print however he looked neither out to sea nor toward coverock but headed straight for the first cottage the same that stands above north corner to-day a man named billy eddy lived there then and when my father burst into the kitchen bawling rack rack he saw billy eddy's wife anne standing there in her clogs with a shawl over her head and her clothes wringing wet save the chap says billy eddy's wife anne what do you mean by crying stale fish at that rate but tis a wreck i tell ye i was eaten too and so has every one with an eye in his head and with that she pointed straight over my father's shoulder and he turned and there close under dollar point at the end of cover of town he saw another wreck washing and the point black with people like emmets running to and fro in the morning light while he stood staring at her he heard a trumpet sounded on board the notes coming in little jerks like a bird rising against the wind but faintly of course because of the distance and the gale blowing though this had dropped a little she's a transport said billy eddy's wife anne and full of horse soldiers fine long men when she struck they must have pitched the horses over first to lighten the ship for a score of dead horses had washed in a four i left half an hour back and three or four soldiers too fine long corpses and white breeches and jackets of blue and gold i held a lantern to one such a straight young man my father asked her about the trumpeting that's the queerest bit of all she was burning a light when me and my man joined the crowd down there all her masts had gone whether they carried away or were just cut away to ease her i don't rightly know her keelson was broke under her and her bottom sagged and stove and she had just settled down like a sitting hen 
just the least the list to starboard. But a man could stand there easy. They had rigged up ropes across her from bulwark to bulwark, and besides these the men were mustered, holding on like grim death whenever the sea made a clean breach over them, and standing up like heroes as soon as it passed. The captain and the officers were clinging to the rail of the quarter-deck, all in their golden uniforms, waiting for the end, as if twas King George they expected. There was no way to help, for she lay right beyond cast of line, though our folk tried it fifty times, and besides them clung a trumpeter, a whacking big man, and between the heavy seas he would lift his trumpet with one hand and blow a call and every time he blew the men gave a cheer. There, she says, hark ye now, there he goes again. But ye won't hear no cheering any more, for few are left to cheer, and their voice is weak. Bitter cold the wind is, and I reckon it numbs their grip of the ropes, for they were dropping off fast with every sea when my man sent me home to get his breakfast. Another wreck, you say? Well, there's no hope for the tender dears, if tis the manacles. You'd better run down and help yonder, though tis little help any man can give. Not one came in alive while I was there. The tide's flowing, and she won't hold together another hour, they say. Well, sure enough, the end was coming fast when my father got down to the point. Six men had been cast up alive or just breathing, a seaman and five troopers. The seaman was the only one that had breath to speak, and while they carried him into the town, the word went round that the ship's name was the Dispatch, Transport, homeward bound from Coruna, with a detachment of the seven hussars that had been fighting out there with Sir John Moore. The seas had rolled her further over by this time and given her decks a pretty sharp slope, but a dozen men still held on seven by the ropes near the ship's waist, a couple near the break of the poop, and three on the quarter-deck. Of these three my father made out one to be the skipper. Close by him clung an officer in full regimentals. His name, they heard after, was Captain Duncanfield, and last came the tall trumpeter. And if you'll believe me, the fellow was making shift there, at the very last, to blow God save the king. What's more, he got to send us victorious before an extra big sea came bursting across and washed them off the deck, every man but one of the pair beneath the poop, and he dropped his hold before the next wave, being stunned, I reckon. The others went out of sight at once, but the trumpeter, being, as I said, a powerful man as well as a tough swimmer, rose like a duck, rode out a couple of breakers, and came in on the crest of the third. The folks looked to see him broke like an egg at their very feet. But when the smother cleared, there he was, lying face downward on a ledge below them, and one of the men that happened to have a rope round him, I forget the fellow's name, if I ever heard it, jumped down and grabbed him by the ankle as he began to slip back. Before the next big sea, the pair were hauled high enough to be out of harm, and another heave brought them up to grass quick work. But Master Trumpeter wasn't quite dead. Nothing worse than a cracked head and three stave ribs. In twenty minutes or so they had him in bed with the doctor to tend him. Now was the time, nothing being left alive upon the transport, for my father to tell of the sloop he'd seen driving upon the manacles. And when he got a hearing, though the most were set upon salvage, and believed the wreck in the hand, so to say, to be worth half a dozen they couldn't see. A few good volunteers to start off with him and have a look. They crossed Lowland Point. No ship to be seen on the manacles, nor anywhere upon the sea. One or two was for calling my father a liar. "'Wait till we come to Dean Point,' said he. Sure enough, on the far side of Dean Point, they found the sloop's mainmast washing about with half a dozen men lashed to it. Men in red jackets, every mother's son drowned and staring. And a little further on, just under the Dean, three or four bodies cast up on the shore, one of them a small drummer boy, side drum and all, and nearby part of a ship's gig with 
HMS Primrose cut on the sternboard. From this point on, the shore was littered thick with wreckage and dead bodies, the most of them marines in uniform, and in Godrevy's cove, in particular, a heap of furniture from the captain's cabin, and among it a watertight box, not much damaged and full of papers, by which, when it came to be examined next day, the wreck was easily made out to be the primrose of eighteen guns outward bound from Portsmouth with a fleet of transports for the Spanish War. Thirty sail, I've heard, but I've never heard what became of them. Being handled by merchant skippers, no doubt they rode out the gale and reached the Tagus safe and sound. Not but what the captain of the Primrose, mine was his name, did quite right to try and club-haul his vessel when he found himself under the land, only he never ought to have got there, if he took proper soundings. But it's easy talking. The Primrose, sir, was a handsome vessel, for her size one of the handsomest in the King's service, and newly fitted out at Plymouth Dock. So the boys had brave pickings from her in the way of brasswork, ship's instruments, and the like, let alone some barrels of stores not much spoiled. They loaded themselves with as much as they could carry and started for home, meaning to make a second journey before the preventive men got wind of their doings and came to spoil the fun. Hello, says my father, and dropped his gear. I do believe there's a leg moving. And running for, he stooped over the small drummer boy that I told you about. The poor little chap was lying there with his face a mass of bruises and his eyes closed, but he had shifted one leg an inch or two and was still breathing. So my father pulled out a knife and cut him free from his drum that was latched on to him with a double turn of manila rope, and took him up and carried him along there to this very room that we are sitting in. He lost a good deal by this, for when he went back to fetch the bundle he dropped, the preventive men had got hold of it and were thick as thieves along the foreshore, so that twas only by paying one or two to look the other way that he picked up anything worth carrying off which you'll allow to be hard, seeing that he was the first man to give news of the wreck. Well, the inquiry was held, of course, and my father gave evidence, and for the rest they had to trust to the sloop's papers, for not a soul was saved besides the drummer boy, and he was raving in a fever, brought on by the cold and the fright. And the seamen and the five troopers gave evidence about the loss of the dispatch, the tall trumpeter, too, whose ribs were healing, came forward and kissed the book. But somehow his head had been hurt in coming ashore, and he talked foolish-like. And twas easy seen he would never be a proper man again. The others were taken up to Plymouth, and so went their ways. But the trumpeter stayed on in Coverock, and King George, finding he was fit for nothing, sent him down a trifle of a pension after a while, enough to keep him in board and lodging, with a bit of tobacco over. Now, the first time that this man, William Talifer, he called himself, met with a drummer boy, was about a fortnight after the little chap had bettered enough to be allowed a short walk out of doors, which he took, if you please, in full regimentals. There never was a soldier so proud of his dress. His own suit had shrunk a brave bit with the salt water, but into ordinary frock and corduroys he declared he would not get, not if he had to go naked the rest of his life. So my father, being a good-natured man, handy with the needle, turned to and repaired damages with a piece or two of scarlet cloth cut from the jacket of one of the drowned marines. Well, the poor little chap chanced to be standing in this rig-out, down by the gate of Gunner's Meadow, where they had buried two score and over of his comrades. The morning was a fine one, early in March month, and along came the cracked trumpeter, likewise taking a stroll. Hello, says he. Good morning, and what might you be doing here? I was a wishing, says the boy. I had a pair of drumsticks. Our lads were buried yonder without so much as a drum tapped or a musket fired. And that's not Christian burial for British soldiers. Foot, <laughs> says the trumpeter, and spat on the ground a parcel of marines. The boy eyed him a second or so and answered up. If I'd a tav of turf handy, 
I'd bung it at your mouth, you greasy cavalryman, and learn you to speak respectful of your betters. The Marines are the handiest body of men in the service. The trumpeter looked down on him from the height of six foot two and asked, Did they die well? They died very well. There was a lot of running to and fro at first, and some of the men began to cry and a few to strip off their clothes. But when the ship fell off for the last time, Captain Mine turned and said something to Major Griffiths, the commanding officer on board, and the Major called out to me to beat to quarters. It might have been for a wedding. He sang it out so cheerful. We'd had word already that twas to be a parade order, and the men fell in as trim and decent as if they were going to church, one or two even trying to shave at the last moment. The Major wore his medals. One of the seeing I had worked to keep the drum steady, the sling being a bit loose for me, and the wind, what you remember, lashed it tight with a piece of rope, and that saved my life afterward, a drum being as good as a cork until it's stove. I kept beating away until every man was on decks, and then the major formed them up and told them to die like British soldiers. And the chaplain was in the middle of a prayer when she struck. In ten minutes she was gone. That was how they died, cavalrymen. And that was very well done, drummer of the Marines. What's your name? John Christian. Mine's William George Talifer, trumpeter of the Seventh Light Dragoons, the Queen's Own. I played God Save the King while our men were drowning. Captain Duncanfield told me to sound a call or two, to put them in heart. But that matter of God save the king was a notion of my own. I won't say anything to hurt the feelings of a marine, even if he's not much over five foot tall. But the Queen's own hussars is a tearing fine regiment. As between horse and foot, tis a question of who gets a chance. All the way from Sahagun to Coruna, twas we that took and gave the knocks at Mayorga and Rueda and Benevente. The reason, sir, I can speak the name so pat, is that my father learned him by heart afterward from the trumpeter, who was always talking about Mayorga and Rueda and Benevente. We made the rear guard under gentle Paget, drove the French every time, and all the infantry did was to sit about in wine shops till we whipped him out and steal and straggle and play the tomfool in general. And when it came to a stand-up fight at Coruna, "'Twas we that had to stay seasick aboard the transports "'and watch the infantry in the thick of the caper. "'Very well they behaved to, especially the 4th Regiment, "'and the 42nd Highlanders, and the dirty half-hundred. "'Oh, aye, they're decent regiments all three, "'but the Queen's own hushers is a tearing fine regiment. "'So you played on your drum when the ship was going down. "'Drummer John Christian. "'I'll have to get you a new pair of sticks.' The very next day the trumpeter marched into Helston and got a carpenter there to turn him a pair of boxwood drumsticks for the boy. And this was the beginning of one of the most curious friendships you ever heard tell of. Nothing delighted the pair more than to borrow a boat of my father and pull out to the rocks where the primrose and the dispatch had struck and sunk. And on still days it was pretty to hear them out there off the manacles, the drummer playing his tattoo for they always took their music with them, and the trumpeter practising calls and making his trumpet speak like an angel. But if the weather turned roughish, they'd be walking together and talking. Leastwise the youngster listened while the other discoursed about Sir John's campaign in Spain and Portugal, telling how each little skirmish befell, and of Sir John himself and General Baird and General Paget and Colonel Vivian, his own commanding officer, and what kind of men they were and of the last bloody stand-up at Coruna, and so forth, as if neither could have enough. But all this had to come to an end in the late summer, for the boy, John Christian, being now well and strong again, must go up to Plymouth to report himself. Twas his own wish, for I believe King George had forgotten all about him. But his friend wouldn't hold him back. As for the trumpeter, my father had made an arrangement to take him on as lodger, as soon as the boy left, and on the morning fixed for the start, he was up at the door here by five o'clock, with his trumpet slung by his side, and all the rest of his belongings in a small valise. A Monday morning it was, and after breakfast he had fixed to walk with the boy some way on the road toward Helston, where the coach started. 
my father left them at breakfast together and went out to meet the pig and do a few odd morning jobs of that sort when he came back the boy was still at table and the trumpeter sat with the rings in his hands hitched together just as they be at this moment look at this he says to my father showing him the lock i picked it off a starving brass worker in lisbon and it is not one of your common locks that one word of six letters will open at any time there's genius in this lock for you only to make the ring spell any six-letter word you please and snap down the lock upon that and never a soul can open it not the maker even until somebody comes along that knows the word you snapped it on now johnny here's goin' and he leaves his drum behind him for though he can make pretty music on it the parchment sags in wet weather by reason of the sea-water getting at it and if he carries it to plymouth they'll only condemn it and give him another and as for me i shan't have the heart to put lip to the trumpet any more when johnny's gone so we've chosen a word together and locked him together upon that and by your leave i'll hang him here together on the hook over your fireplace maybe johnny'll come back maybe not maybe if he comes i'll be dead and gone and he'll take em apart and try their music for old sake's sake but if he never comes nobody can separate em for nobody besides knows the word and if you marry and have sons you can tell em that here are tied together the souls of johnny christian drummer of the marines and william george talifer once trumpeter of the queen's own hussars amen with that he hung the two instruments upon the hook there and the boy stood up and thanked my father and shook hands and the pair went out of the door toward helston somewhere on the road they took leave of one another nobody saw the parting nor heard what was said between them about 3 in the afternoon the trumpeter came walking back over the hill and by the time my father came home from the fishing the cottage was tidied up and the tea ready and the whole place shining like a new pin from that time for 5 years he lodged here with my father looking after the house and tilling the garden and all the while he was steadily failing the hurt in his head spreading in a manner to his limbs my father watched the feebleness growing on him but said nothing and from first to last neither spake a word about the drummer john christian nor did any letter reach them nor word of his doings the rest of the tale you're free to believe sir or not as you please it stands upon my father's words and he always declared he was ready to kiss the book upon it before judge and jury he said too that he never had the wit to make up such a yarn and he defied any one to explain about the lock in particular by any other tale but you shall judge for yourself my father said that about 3 o'clock in the morning april 14th of the year 14 he and william talifer were sitting here just as you and i sir are sitting now my father had put on his clothes a few minutes before and was mending his pillar by the light of the horn lantern meaning to set off before daylight to haul the trammel the trumpeter hadn't been to bed at all two at the last he mostly spent his nights and his days to dozing in the elbow chair where you sit at this minute he was dozing then my father said with his chin dropped forward on his chest when a knock sounded upon the door and the door opened and in walked an upright young man in scarlet regimentals he had grown a brave bit and his face the color of wood ashes but it was the drummer john christian only his uniform was different from the one he used to wear and the figures 38 shone in brass upon his collar the drummer walked past my father as if he never saw him and stood by the elbow chair and said trumpeter trumpeter are you one with me and the trumpeter just lifted the lids of his eyes and answered how should i not be one with you drummer johnny johnny boy if you come i count if you march i mark time until the discharge comes the discharge has come tonight said the drummer and the word is corona no longer and stepping to the chimney place he unhooked the drum and trumpet and began to twist the brass rings of the lock spelling the word aloud so c o r u n a when he had fixed the last letter the padlock opened in his hand 
Did you know, Trumpeter, that when I came to Plymouth, they put me into a line regiment? The 38th is a good regiment, answered the old hussar, still in his dull voice. I went back with them from Sahagun to Coruna. At Coruna they stood in General Fraser's division, on the right. They behaved well. But I'd fain see the Marines again, says the drummer, handing him the trumpet. And you, you shall call once more for the Queen's own. Matthew, he says, suddenly, turning on my father. And when he turned, my father saw, for the first time, that his scarlet jacket had a round hole by the breastbone, and that the blood was welling there. Matthew, we shall want your boat. Then my father rose on his legs like a man in a dream, while they two slung on, the one his drum and the other his trumpet. He took the lantern and went quaking before them down to the shore, and they breathed heavily behind him, and they stepped into his boat, and my father pushed off. Row you first for Dollar Point, says the drummer. So my father rode them past the white houses of Coverock to Dollar Point, and there, at a word, lay on his oars. And the trumpeter of William Talifer put his trumpet to his mouth and sounded the reveille. The music of it was like rivers running. They will follow, said the drummer. Matthew, pull you now for the manacles. So my father pulled for the manacles and came to an easy close outside Carn Dew. And the drummer took his sticks and beat a tattoo, there by the edge of the reef, and the music of it was like a rolling chariot. That will do, says he, breaking off. They will follow. Pull now for the shore under Gunner's Meadow. Then my father pulled for the shore and ran his boat in under Gunner's Meadow, and they stepped out, all three, and walked up to the meadow. By the gate the drummer halted and began his tattoo again, looking out toward the darkness over the sea. And while the drum beat and my father held his breath, there came up out of the sea and the darkness a troop of many men, horse and foot, and formed up among the graves, and others rose out of the graves and formed up, drowned marines with bleached faces and pale hussars riding their horses, all lean and shadowy. There was no clatter of hoofs or accoutrements, my father said, but a soft sound all the while, like the beating of a bird's wing, and a black shadow lay like a pool about the feet of all. The drummer stood upon a little knoll just inside the gate, and beside him the tall trumpeter with hand on hip watching them gather, and behind them both my father, clinging to the gate. When no more came, the drummer stopped playing and said, Call the roll. Then the trumpeter stepped forward toward the end man of the rank and called, Troop Sergeant Major Thomas Irons. And the man answered in a thin voice, Here, Troop Sergeant Major Thomas Irons. How is it with you? The man answered, How should it be with me? When I was young, I betrayed a girl, and when I was grown, I betrayed a friend, and for these I must pay. But I died as a man ought, God save the king. The trumpeter called to the next man. Trooper Henry Buckingham. The next man answered, Here. Trooper Henry Buckingham, how is it with you? How should it be with me? I was a drunkard, and I stole, and in Lugo, in a wine shop, I killed a man. But I died as a man should, God save the king. So the trumpeter went down the line, and when he had finished, the drummer took it up, hailing the dead marines in their order. Each man answered to his name, and each man ended with, God save the king. When all were hailed, the drummer stepped back to his mound and called, It is well, you are content, and we are content to join you. Wait now a little while. With this he turned and ordered my father to pick up the lantern and lead the way back. As my father picked it up, he heard the ranks of the dead men cheer and call, God save the king, all together, and saw them waver and fade back into the dark like a breath fading off a pane. But when they came back here to the kitchen, and my father set the lantern down, it seemed they both forgot about him. But the drummer turned in the lantern light, and my father could see the blood still welling out of the hole in his breast and took the trumpet sling from around the other's neck 
and locked drum and trumpet together again, choosing the letters on the lock very carefully. While he did this, he said, the word is no more Coruna, but Bayon. As you left out an N in Coruna, so must I leave out an N in Bayon. And before snapping the padlock, he spelt out the word slowly, B A Y O N E. After that, he used no more speech, but turned and hung the two instruments back on the hook, and then took the trumpeter by the arm, and the pair walked out into the darkness, glancing neither to right nor left. My father was on the point of following when he heard a sort of sigh behind him, and there, sitting in the elbow chair, was the very trumpeter he had just seen walk out by the door. If my father's heart jumped before, you may believe it jumped quicker now. But after a bit, he went up to the man asleep in the chair and put a hand upon him. It was the trumpeter in flesh and blood that he touched, but though the flesh was warm, the trumpeter was dead. Well, sir, they buried him three days after, and at first my father was minded to say nothing about his dream as he thought it. But the day after the funeral he met Parson Kendall coming from Helston Market, and the parson called out, "'Have ye heard the news the coach brought down this morning?' "'What news?' says my father. "'Why, that peace is agreed upon.' "'None too soon,' says my father. "'Not soon enough for our poor lads at Bayonne.' The parson answered. "'Bayonne!' cries my father with a jump. "'Why, yes!' And the parson told him all about a great sally the French had made on the night of April 13th. "'Do you happen to know if the 38th Regiment was engaged?' my father asked. "'Come now,' said Parson Kendall. "'I didn't know you were so well up in the campaign. But as it happens, I do know that the 38th was engaged. For twas they that held the cottage and stopped the French advance.' Still my father held his tongue and when a week later he walked in Helston and bought a mercury of the Sherburn rider, and got the landlord of the Angel to spell out the list of killed and wounded, sure enough, there among the killed was drummer John Christian of the 38th foot. After this there was nothing for a religious man but to make a clean breast. So my father went up to Parson Kendall and told the whole story. The parson listened and put a question or two and then asked, "'Have you tried to open the lock since that night?' "'I haven't dared to touch it,' says my father. "'Then come along and try. When the parson came to the cottage here, he took the things off the hook and tried the lock. Did he say by own? The word has seven letters. Not if you spell it with one N as he did,' says my father." Parson spelt it out. B A Y O N E. Phew, says he, for the lock had fallen open in his hand. He stood, considering it a moment, and then he says, I tell you what, I shouldn't blab this all round the parish if I was you. You'd get no credit for truth telling, and a miracle's wasted on a set of fools. But if you like, I'll shut down the lock again upon a holy word that no one but me shall know, and neither drummer nor trumpeter, dead or alive, shall frighten the secret out of me. I wish to heaven you would, parson, says my father. Parson chose the holy word there and then, and shut the lock back upon it, and hung the drum and trumpet back in their place. He is gone long since, taking the word with him. Until the lock is broken by force, nobody will ever separate those two. End of The Roll Call of the Reef by Arthur Quiller Couch Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama